all our panelists in this uh, session, Decoding India Scams, are senior business journalists who are also authors of bestseller books on business enterprises. And uh, some of them are on business scandals. And that is the subject of our discussion today. Tamal Bandhupadhyay, he's written six books on banking and related subjects. Uh, all of them are bestsellers and he writes a weekly column on banking for business standard. His most uh, uh, visible book is one on Sahara, which traces the rise and fall of its founder. Prakash, ke ke Prakash. His book is focused on the flamboyant Vijay Malya and how <clears throat> Vijay Malya grew his business empire beyond liquor to aviation, chemicals and dabbled in all kinds of uh, unlikely endeavors like buying the sword of Tipu Sultan and, and so forth. Giri is now the editor of the Bangalore edition of the Hindu business line. He also teaches journalism at the Indian Institute of Journalism and New Media. And Pawan Lal, he has written a fascinating book on Nirav Modi <coughs> called Flawed, the rise and fall of India's diamond mogul. Nirav Modi is a lot in the news now. And Pawan, who grew up in Texas and is now in Mumbai, has met Nirav Modi many times and he shares a lot of very interesting personal anecdotes, <coughs> some of which are there in his book. He says his passion has been to expose corporate conspiracies and industry scandals. He's written on them for publications like Business Standard, The Telegraph, and also the Dallas Morning News. Now, all of them have captured these scandals featuring these businessmen against the backdrop of their prevailing practices of prevailing practices in their industries uh, at the time. Uh, at the time or during the times these uh, scandals unfolded, uh, the regulatory regime that was prevailing at the time and how, so how their business impulses were shaped by their years of, uh, you know, in college and in their growing up years, their formative years. So you get a context to all of these. Why did they do what they did? Now, all, all one of the, uh, one of the very important things readers don't realize when journalists write these books or even others is that uh, we guys have uh, we're not the police or the excise authorities or customs or income tax we have no right to get any of this information we have to somehow coax this out persuade it uh, dig for it and it's it's not easy it's a very treacherous game in, in some cases now tamal pavan and giri will hopefully tell us what are the challenges they faced and how they went about overcoming them? I'll keep this short. If uh, Amal being the senior most, I'd like to start with him. Tamal, uh, are you, is Tamal there? Tamal said he ducked out briefly for a meeting, but I don't see, is Tamal? Is Tamal there? Or maybe we can start with Giri, meanwhile, Tamal and uh, Pawan could join us. So Giri, why don't you tell us, I mean, your uh, subject, uh, Vijay Malya, uh, was not a very easy subject to cover because he's been stonewalling the press for a long time now. How did you decide to write this book? I mean, I, said I wanted to first get to the impulse of why did you decide on writing something like this? Because it's surely not an easy task, right? Yeah, thanks, Shankar. Actually, what happened was that um, there was this article which appeared in the Hindu, uh, which I had uh, I had written. Uh, you know, the editor called me up and said, uh, "Can you write about Vijay Malya and his empire? What has what's been happening and the uh, update and all that?" So at that time, the Hindu uh, had a new editor and they were experimenting with uh, coming out one uh, coming out with a very uh, big, so around three thousand word article on uh, scams and stuff like that so the mine was the first one and i wrote about it and it appeared on sunday and uh, the phone calls didn't stop because of the fact that malia is very well known and uh, that led to penguin uh, calling up the editor and saying that uh, is Gri prakash interested in writing a book so i said why not so that's how i ended up uh, writing the book no. <clears throat> Although he's uh, most well known for, or he got uh, he, he got uh, his most recent visibilities because of Kingfisher, 
I remember in the early days uh, when he acquired Shaw Wallace, his uh, fights with Kishore uh, uh, Chabria were. Uh, Manu, Manu Chabria. Manu Chabria, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think wasn't Kishore also involved? Yeah, in he was. He was. Yeah. So those were uh, extremely difficult to cover because there were so many lawsuits and very arcane and dense. And I mean, to be a uh, somebody who's covering that was itself a big challenge. I mean, to make sense of that, I don't think even uh, at some point I don't think even the players themselves, you know, Manu Chabri and Vijay Malayam itself understood where things were going. So uh, I wanted to uh, take off from there and ask you, apart from the difficulties of getting all this information and uh, navigating through them and making sense of them, what are some of the challenges you faced in writing this book? So, uh, the, of course, the biggest challenge was that uh, uh, we we one had you know uh, I I I called up Vijay Malayan you know I've been tracking him for quite some time so we used to meet for interviews and off the record kind of conversations but then when I told him he said sorry Giri I am writing a book of my own so I, I don't want to uh, contribute to your book and he also said that if I don't contribute none of my colleagues will do. So that, that was very clear. I said, you write your book, I'll write mine. So how does it really matter? He said, no, um, I'm very clear about it. So, and, and you know, those, uh, he's not the sort of person who will call you up. If you send him a message at 10 o'clock in the morning, he's not someone who will call you up, say, after a couple of hours, an hour or something like that. He'll call you up at around 2 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, and then you, <laughs> you suddenly get up, the phone is ringing, and then you know Malia is there and you speak to him. So I kept on talking to him, but he was not very willing. So the only other option for me uh, was to actually do a lot of research, go to go to libraries and uh, look up old uh, uh, copies of uh, the, uh, the the stories that appeared or the articles that appeared on uh, this face off between uh, Manu Chabria, who, who used to own Shah Wallace, and before that. Um, but I what also helped was that. Quite a few um, deep throats available, you know, they were willing to talk to me. So whenever I uh, made a lot of notes out of these uh, articles, I used to go and ask them uh, and find out whether whatever that's, that's there and what what, are, what was the background for this, uh, whatever that was happening with Chavales. So that way it actually helped. And uh, also the there were some YouTube channel, you know, videos about him speaking at I am Calcutta, and they were childhood friends uh, who were willing to speak. Uh, so there were people who uh, who'd, who'd say that they would speak, but won't turn up for the meeting. Uh, it was quite a good. Uh, it was quite an interesting journey when, when I wrote that book. <clears throat> okay, uh, of all that you mentioned, I think the most uh, colorful and fascinating. I uh, think is your reference to Deep Throat. Uh, Deep Throat became mm -hmm. famous. Uh, uh, it was yeah. famous earlier for, for other reasons, but I think uh, all the president's men, uh, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, uh, made that term famous. Uh, anybody, th this whole session hopefully will encourage uh, aspiring writers to you know, attempt similar uh, books and also perhaps other business writers who may have. Uh, there's no uh, shared clear of this area uh, thinking that it, it's too difficult and too treacherous. I guess finding the deep throat is the is the trickiest part, right? How do you decide who that person is going to be and how do you cultivate uh, him or her? Could you give uh, an example? I'm sure you cannot name your deep throat, but... Yeah, yeah, obviously I can't name them, but then, uh, you know, they're all around. They are, they are, they are uh, you know, they could be people who are with... Uh, you know, the group, the UV group, the ex employees, current employees, and uh, the, uh, you know, uh, those who have do, those who had worked with him in a personal capacity. And uh, one good thing was that I had been tracking Malia for uh, nearly a decade, so it actually helped because along the way you get to meet a lot of people who are willing to talk to you. And then I, I just had to uh, do a bit of a refresh, you know, press the refresh button and People did open out, but but it was very clear that they, they made it very clear that as usual, one of the biggest challenges for a journalist is that most of what they get to know uh, uh, is always uh, off the record. 
So I mm. couldn't name any of them. Yeah. Uh, that that was a bit of a challenge. And then you know there were a lot of stuff that happened much before I was born, uh, <laughs> or when I was a teenager. So that was a bit of a challenge. Uh, but 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 a lot of people actually helped me. Yeah. Thanks so much. Is Tamal uh, on? Is he? Is Tamal have you joined? Yes. Um. I think uh, Mr. Tamal and uh, Mr. Pawan both are here. Very In good. In fact, uh, it would be lovely if you all can turn on your videos, uh, Mr. Bandhu Padhyay and Mr. Lal. Thank you, uh, Tamal. Pawan, Tamal, you would also we still see only a photograph. But in the meantime, if you're having difficulty in turning on your video, perhaps you could start by telling us a little bit about uh, your book. What were, I don't know at what time you got in, but if uh, if you've been following what uh, Giri has been talking about, some of the challenges that he faced in writing his book. And I'm sure you faced lots of challenges in writing the Sahara book and some of the other books as well. And your forthcoming book on banking scandals. Tamal, maybe while we wait for Tamal, perhaps Pawan could uh, tell us. Pawan, you've uh, written on the most colorful character uh, it's made of all of all our uh, fantasies. Uh, not uh, not uh, my fantasy, but diamonds are forever. Right? Oh, uh, yeah, diamonds. So are referring to that in your book. <laughs> That's right. So, how, how did you uh, how did you go about some of the challenges you faced? I think the challenges that I had were pretty much the same challenges that anybody writing about corporate fraud would have had. Uh, as uh, you know, my colleague Giri was saying earlier on that uh, a nobody wants to go on record when it comes to something that is already under the glare of the authorities. It's being uh, monitored by the uh, you know the CBI and the uh, the, the enforcement directorate and the police and you know, under the media glare and all of that. The last thing that anybody who is uh, legitimate would want to do is go and stick their neck out, even if they are speaking the truth or simply talking about a, an issue or a matter that is uh, upholding something that is, you know, legal and forthright. The fact of the matter is that, for example, in the case of Nira Modi, I had met a number of his ex-employees and interviewed them in the past when you were doing regular business stories. but and I, of course, followed up with many of them to to see and investigate if we could get further information. And while some of them spoke off the record, some of them spoke uh, on the record, most of them were hesitant and uh, not very keen to divulge too much. Um, at that point in time, some of us may remember not only uh, had Neera Modi uh, and his uh, close associates, his brothers and other family members fled the country, but there were a number of other senior people within the organization, like his CFO and uh, others who had actually been arrested. So Vipul Ambani got arrested. Uh, his senior managers who were part of his uh, admin team who would go to the banks to get these letters of undertaking, which give him the financing and the credit, they were thrown into jail. And there was a very certain sense uh, that, you know, that could happen to you as well. There were even senior board members, you know, from uh, legitimate companies from uh, South India and other corporate areas who are his uh, directors, they also had their accounts frozen and things like that. So people were generally conscious. I think where I got a little bit lucky, uh, just to echo what a little bit of my, uh, you know, former author, former uh, speakers over here on this panel were talking about is that, you know, you, you just have to really uh, keep chasing the sources of data. You have to just keep chasing for that so-called deep throat who will emerge and, and lead you through some sort of a uh, a coherent uh, trail when it comes to chasing the facts and the figures that are relevant to your particular story. In my case, I would have to be very honest and say that I didn't really find a, a live deep throat figure, so to speak. It was actually a source of data. I found uh, an extremely important uh, case file, which was, believe it or not, not in India, but it was by the US prosecution and by the American courts in New York, where three of Nirav's companies had filed for bankruptcy. And those were being investigated by uh, the FBI and by uh, the tax authorities over there. And they had made public a very large 200 or 300 page uh, dossier that gave me a lot of information. It gave me a lot of insight into the entire structure of his shell companies, how the money was routed right down to the carrot of many of the stones that he was actually purchasing and then round tripping. 
So I think your deep throat can sometimes also be an unexpected source of data. And uh, the lesson over there for any, any, I guess, writer is to, you know, not keep stopping until you find something of that sort. Yeah. I want to come back to that. But uh, meanwhile, since Samal is uh, back on, I'd like uh, to welcome Tamal. Tamal, thank you so much for coming. And sorry for uh, keeping nice. you up. I know you have a very tight window. But we were talking about, uh, sure. I made a very glorious introduction that you missed. Thank you. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you wrote uh, a book on Sahara and Subrata Roy, which I'm sure was, must have been one of the most or probably the most challenging book among all the six books that you've written, especially yeah. because he had so much to hide. And not just him, but uh, all his uh, various uh, associates and the number of enterprises that he controlled. I mean, it was not 10, 20, 100, but they were in what close to 50,000 enterprises at one time so you don't know where to begin right yeah uh, well no actually um, you know it's always fascinated me as a reporter uh, we are talking now 2020 and i'm talking about early 20s uh, 2000 early 2000s this century when i was actually reporting or heading a bureau and later of course larger bureau and operations of newspaper so i it always fascinated me a company as you rightly says 4799 different kind of you know outfits uh, and uh, 16 verticals and the second largest it claimed the second largest employer under indian Rail after indian railways so as a reporter that always fascinated me because his main business was shadow banking so called shadow banking all the residuary non banking finance company are in his biggest one and second was, of course, Kolkata-based uh, PRLS, which RBI could stop, but this um, uh, Sahara RBI could not stop. So it was fascinating. And unlike these days when you can get access to balance sheets and annual report um, on, on the websites, you know, the, uh, the corporate ministry and all, but those days, getting an annual report of an unlisted entity was really, really difficult stuff. So I initially, I'm talking about 2006, 8, those are the days I used to get hold of an annual report, which is a, which is a very precious thing, uh, you know, the balance sheet. And then see the numbers and then always found that the numbers are not, not telling that there is something, something fishy about it or I thought so. And that's how the curiosity started. And to be, to be fair to uh, Sahara, they were pretty open, they're pretty cooperative. You know, in fact, before I started the book, um, it, it took me time to convince uh, Mr. Subhadra Roy to, to, to meet me. Uh, but once I was able to convince him, he did meet me. I spent uh, two days at Sahara, Sahara and um, pretty, I don't remember, maybe two, three hours with him, a long winding conversation on everything I wanted to ask uh, under the sun. He did answer because that was the time when RBI already tightened the screw. And uh, there were various court cases and SEBI also after him. Uh, essentially, where is the money coming from? One, I mean, I don't want to get into the detail, but one IPO, um, uh, DRHP filing with SEBI, one of the group companies, that's how they figured out that there could be something wrong. And who are the, where is the money coming from? Are there genuine uh, investors or the depositors or they are, they are fronting for others? So those are the questions. And I had long conversation with uh, Mr. Subrata Roy and he was extremely gentle, a man with fine taste and all. And that's not once I met him a few times and they're pretty cooperative and they answered every question I played back and later whatever I wanted, they did cooperate with me. But I don't know what went wrong. <laughs> Even before the book was published, I was slapped with a 200 crore defamation suit. Probably it's a unique case uh, in, the, in the book world. Probably um, uh, Mr. Roy's expectation was very different What because I never shared, apart from his interview, which was on record, I never shared the rest of the book. I never told them what is his book all about. Uh, I was in search of truth. Uh, it's to sound, it sounds very cliche, but that's, that's what. It's not a missionary zeal, nothing. It's just a uh, curiosity of a journalist that what exactly happened. So that took me to different terrains with uh, different kind of regulators, KB, Reserve Bank of India. And when people get to know people from different parts of India, they did reach out to me with their stories. And that's how the story was built. And uh, the rest of it, 
as you know, I, I got into trouble in the sense it was filed. Uh, I was slapped with the 200 crore case and in Calcutta High Court, not in Mumbai. And then I was moving Supreme Court with a special lead petition. And then uh, there was a discussion among us and um, they did withdraw the case. And of course, I had to carry a disclaimer, which essentially tells that this is this story is not to be trusted. This story is defamatory. This book is full of lies, so on and so forth. But uh, if this is the way to, uh, it is their opinion, I respect it. We carried that and the book is <laughs> a unique case where a book, if you open it, it says that it's all about yeah. you. It's amazing. I, I remember a Norman Mailer book like that uh, many, many years ago. But I mean, you open this book and the first thing that you read in the flap and on the back cover, not on the back cover, but uh, on the flap inside, flap is don't buy this book because it's all lies. And I think it's a tribute to your persuasive skills, uh, Tamal, that you were able to charm your way to get them to take that uh, 200 crore lawsuit off your back. Of course, uh, they must have known, known that it's a uh, you know, uh, small change for you. But still, uh, getting that uh, interview with uh, or getting time, face time with uh, Subrata Rai and also Giri and Pawan, uh, the two of you also uh, got your subjects to cooperate and talk to you. And I think that's a very, very big achievement. I'm sure getting that, it's not simply a matter of sending them an email asking for an appointment. I know Tamal has gone to great lengths like feeding his subjects cat on the dining table to charm his way into you know, a source. So could you share us up some juicy parts about how, maybe one or two examples of how you to employ some unusual uh, you know, ingenious ways to get to your sources and get them to talk, get them to relax, basically. No, my, you know, it's basically. I think it's a, it's a psychological game. It's it's um, um, to, <laughs> I don't know why we do interpret. It's just making love. You know, different uh, men and different women have different switches. Uh, what turns you on? So it, you need to figure out what's the right switch uh, for the person. Uh, you know, is it is somebody within an organization is unhappy uh, and justifiably so? If somebody has a sort of uh, you know extremely moral person and, and does not tolerate the misgovernance, if somebody gets the kick of just a clandestine affair with a affair quote unquote with a journalist by passing on information, it what is the what this is how how do you get the story? So that's all. Everything falls in place, and this is not about book i think about reporting also of course nowadays is very different because this is a different world of uh, uh, media what we see but our uh, media world which i'm three decades uh, been associated was very different where essentially sourcing story was uh, it's, it's very critical and so is with the book and uh, unlike the developed market where after the sunset after the market out everything closed and weekends are nothing happening and all because you always follow the conventional source uh, here you don't uh, have the conventional source, uh, didn't have the conventional source. So it's essentially how do you befriend people or how do you get cozy with the person and make the person tell you the story? Give that, us an example. That nobody can... <laughs> well, you know, so name somebody. You told me the cat story. Let me tell you this. There's a gentleman who was, again, nothing to do with the Pope, who was a, who was a, who was a CEO um, of a very large financial intermediary. And it's very difficult to crash. The person was so it so much so much is ethical and go care for governance. You just can you know stab him, but will not get a word out of him. But fortunately, you know there was one day I got invitation for something at a family at his family and all, and then I figured out that uh, he had a cat. And that cat was actually important. He just told me, introduce the cat that it's a she, and she can't uh, she can't follow uh, Hindi or Marathi or Bengali. It is my mother tongue. She only speaks English and understand English because this cat was uh, so, um, imported from New York, where her, her son uh, her son was studying in New York and found the cat stuck in some lift, and then he sent it back to India. And this, I, and I found it in his. Then I found that you know, on his, uh, on his uh, lobby and the houses are full of photographs of the cats. And I, I'm not exactly fond of cat. I am very fond of dogs, but you know, both are four legged animals. So let me be become a cat lover. So the next, uh, ne next uh, one hour, we just discuss the cat. 
uh, you know, I even allowed the cat to share my food on my dining table, which the gentleman was doing. Okay, that's all. And then the old, oh, then the old doors got opened. and uh, we got an extremely cozy relationship of course every one hour i discuss or half an hour I discuss certain percent of time has to be invested in discussing the cat and the cat's breed what needs to be done has how often this she takes bath is she fond of um, fish or milk whatever and trust to me i did carry some gift also for the cat a couple of times what is the food and rest of the rest of his tenure i was probably the closest to him as a journalist so that's only one example whether you write a book or write a news report you need to at the second stage we go out and check verify how the things uh, there could be supporting evidence there could be affidavit um, picked up from law courts which are all all public documents there could be board uh, papers there could be many other things um bombay stock exchange uh, filings so on and so forth but the preliminary how do you get the first story uh, that was very critical whether you writing a newspaper story yeah, so or long. or writing or writing a book and this i always use because all my books my sixth book and the current book uh, let me just give uh, give give you two minute yeah, please, uh, please. publicity uh, which is uh, which is called pandemonium the great indian banking tragedy which is being released on 9th of uh, november we are just about 10 12 days away has a one chapter called the fallen in fallen angels there i dissected what went wrong uh, with yes bank graphically how rana kapoor made the yes bank to my bank to no bank my yeah. bank is saying not as a figuratively because that's one of the names which were discussed initially uh, what would be the name of the bank there are five names they dis- they were discussed and then they chose yes bank but my bank also one of them but rana kapoor may turn yes bank into my bank and then ultimately no bank for him or how miss kochar uh, you know uh, you ask him ford yeah and i say say bank had the money yeah. out of her hands so those stories are graphically described and and many others many others uh, what happened in the nbfc sector how they have fallen uh, whether it's um, you know the the on housing or ilfs uh, what's the what is yeah. the right story and how the investigative agencies have treated the banks how the banks were just told you know you are under arrest and thrown into arthur road jail arthur road uh, jail and what kind of nights they need to spend so these are all weaving stories getting stories out of people that's the first stage uh, since you said that your audience will part of be a uh, people who are interested in writing so keeping that in mind it's very important to engage people and get the stories out of them and then the next stage is how do i justify what i am saying so i need the proof on this for instance for the sahara i had truck loads of papers and i have to keep because of the case i have been told that i need to keep them for 10 years or so a uh, large part of my study is kept only on those people these are all income tax notices these are all um, in the various high courts and supreme court judgments and affidavits and reserve bank of india reports etc etc i did try rti but i was not successful every time i i don't know how many rti i, I filed with reserve bank of india and sebi to get things but every time um, the regulators hedged and they give some excuse why information cannot be shared so rti is one route uh, people do use but in my case i was not successful in in getting information of rti so i got the stories from people the people who are involved the dramatic personnel and then i got it justified and supported by by papers as i said reams of papers the income tax notices the investigations rbi investigation i had to source it different way and the high court and supreme court judgments and and the affidavits they are also very very important sources yeah, thanks someone for sharing that i mean uh, that's very very fascinating uh, in fact uh, subrata roy is a uh, habit of sending truck loads of data right i remember in your book you mentioned how he sent uh, 20 or 30 truck loads of data files to sebi when they are pulled him up for something uh now uh, you mentioned one thing which is very interesting and you talked about how in, in western markets uh, or in developed countries uh, access to information is uh, perhaps easier and i wanted to get back to pavan on that pavan uh, are you still there i yeah i'm here i'm right yeah here. pavan uh, you you uh, worked with the dallas morning news and written for the washington business journal right that's right uh, a reporting uh, 
on business scandals in the US, uh, how is it different in terms of access to data? Because getting all this information and ascertaining its their veracity is a is a big deal, especially in uh, today's day of in, in today's day and age of fake news. Uh, could you share a little insight? No, I mean, I, to give you an example, the courtroom data that I was talking about earlier, right? I mean, the legal uh, dossiers and the legal files on the investigation uh, that I had uh, basically got on Nirav Modi and on the cases that were opened on him. Now, these were basically forensics from the courts in New York that were initiated in partnership with um, uh, some of the auditors over here. And they managed to snap together and close the file within about five to eight months. And in that time, there was a publicly available dossier of, like I was saying, a couple of hundred pages, which had full details of all the shell companies, all of his circular transactions, right down to the carriage of the individual diamonds that were being purchased by these companies operated by Nirav Modi and his enterprises. But in that same amount of time, you know, even though the chart sheets had all been done and all of this was uh, pretty much uh, public in terms of the the Nirav Modi uh, absconding and he was in jail also at that time, you didn't have as much information available over here. And I think part of that has to do with also how our legal systems are operating. You will have uh, a charge sheet filed by ED, you will have a charge sheet filed by CBI, you will have a charge sheet filed by income tax, you will have a charge sheet filed by somebody else. And most of these documents, as we all know, run into thousands of pages, hundreds of pages, you know. If you look at the Yes Bank case, which is going on right now, um, I think the first round of chart sheeting and all the FIRs and all those reports that they're running into hundreds of pages and they'll go into further hundreds of pages. That is, is there really a requirement for you to have truckloads and boxes of all these and every right down to the minutia? I think, you know, to some extent, if I'm answering your question uh, as briefly as possible, I think the systems overseas when it comes to law enforcement and business they really zero down on what are the laws what are the boxes that need to be checked and where have the violations happened and what is the evidence and that's it they don't you know drill on and on and on which essentially is a technique of uh, i guess circumventing the whole judicial process over here the more paper you throw at something the more complicated it becomes the harder it becomes to decipher facts and uh, uh, you know it's something that perhaps you know is 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 requiring evolution on this end, and probably will happen in the years to come. But yeah, that is come to that. you know. But before I proceed, I want to ask Pooja, how much time do we have? If we want to ask a couple more questions. Yeah, we we have ten more minutes. We have thirteen think, more minutes. Right? Thirteen more includes minutes. Includes the time for Q and A. If we can accommodate a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah, that would include the time for Q and A. Oh. Now, I, I want to ask one uh, very important question of all three of you. And Pawan, since you're on this subject, you do a great service. If you can articulate in maybe two or three bullet points, uh, what needs to be fixed here to make information, and Tamar, you also, information legitimately available, uh, not just to the media, uh, not just to writers, but also to the general public so that there is more transparency in what kind of disclosure requirement do you think we should have learning from best practices elsewhere? I'm not assuming that they have best practices. We may have some best practices of our own. Too. No, actually, I'm not going to answer that question because I think it's a it, there's many different answers to that question. I think the matter more when it comes to scams and frauds is a question of why do we always report the frauds after they've happened? Oh. Why do we report the frauds before it's happening or while it's happening and i think that really is the question and i think if we if we try and catch an asset after it has become bad well that's a good thing to do but i think really why aren't we catching the asset while it is becoming bad and i think you know i'm just using that as a banking analogy to further uh, make the point that you know after the fact is all very well but why does it have to get to a point where you're reaching cancer and then you diagnose it and I mean all of us do that but the point is isn't there a way to catch it while it's happening or before it's happening and I think some of that has to do with the fact that yes maybe all of the data isn't uh, immediately available but I think you know are the constrictions in how we report on that uh, the the deeper challenge 
Yeah, I think uh, that's a good point. And I think uh, I was going to ask Tamal about that. He's written this book that's coming out in 10 days' time that in, includes uh, accounts of what went wrong at S-Bank and with Chanda Kuchar at ICICI. Those cases have not been decided as yet. As yet. They're uh, still in court and investigations are going on. But to be able to write a definitive account of what went wrong, uh, that must be a big challenge. So uh, I think Tamal is right. Uh, you know, on the uh, uh, you know, right on the how are they? It escapes me. How 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 do you write about something that is still a moving target? Your 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 mute, Tamal. Yeah, your operator made me mute. Anyway, so A is this. Um, I don't claim that I have the last word, and um, it's a verdict. It's not what it. What you on see on TV channel that you know I am the jury, I am the judge, and I have passed on the verdict. It's not. It's an unfolding story. I am just trying to. I'm just trying to tell my side of the story. So I don't claim that what I am saying is the definitive, and that's the end of it. That's 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 most important part, and that's about Sahara also. I uh, I raised certain question, but I did not say that Sahara is a money laundering machine. It's up to you. You decide. I just gave you certain certain inputs to make your mind. Similarly, what happened in Yes Bank? It's still unfolding. Rana Kapoor is still behind the bar, or against Chandra Kochar and um, her spouse. The cases are on. I have not produ produced any verdict against them. Uh, I am just explaining things, what is happening, and still in an unfolding story. So that's one part. Other part of your answer, <clears throat> I am not qualified to say are we disadvantage or advantage vis-a-vis -vis Western world because I don't have any experience working overseas. But what the limited point I am making when I am when we are dealing with banks, it is slightly different from others. As a stock market scam or uh, other can, scam is very different. You can be like, you know, it is for the regulators from others. It's far easier to expose something is happening. Don't wait. But bank where your money and my money is involved and the primary job is to protect the de depositors. And there could be run on the bank if something, you know, if, if some stories come out, uh, whether even if that's true. And it's, it's, it's very difficult to then handle it. So I think I'm not justifying what the regulators have done, but in when you are dealing with banks and because banks are dealing with public money, it's pretty, it is sensitive. So you can't expect that you will get to know real time. One inspection happened and one bank CEO is found something is terribly wrong and RBI will, 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 will pronounce that. You don't expect that because if that happens tomorrow, there will be the very next day will be run on the bank. Now, who will protect the bank in that case? So he, it has to be. It has to be little sense. Now, will you take so long? Will you give such a long rope uh, to a regulator, to a promoter who has been misusing his position? That debate can be done. But if you are saying that I, we need to know on a real time basis something happened, I don't think that is possible in the banking segment, primarily because it is dealing with depositor money. Within the financial sector, in certain areas, it can where depositors' money is not involved. So RBI has its own critic database, which, which is from Raghuram Rajan introduced. On an almost real-time basis, they get to know the bank's health, etc., etc. And then uh, certain things the banks need to uh, immediately inform SEBI. Um, uh, there are certain things around. But despite that, uh, it does not, you don't get to know things happen. There is always a lag effect, <clears throat> not because of anything else, but because I think the regulators do not want to destabilize the situation. So financial sector stability is extremely important. And unlike, say, US, India is a bank-led financial system, which is not the case in the, most of the developed markets. You have the corporate bond market, which is much more transparent. Somebody becomes a defaulter, there's no way to hide. But in a bank-led financial system, uh, a default, uh, defaulters can be, you know, because there is a quid pro quo, it helps the banks to uh, to uh, to keep their balance sheets happy. If you have the default, uh, defaulters also. Uh, so there could be a sort of arrangement. And RBI knows it, but still it takes time because it, it may end up uh, leading to a run on the bank and ultimately um, uh, uh, creates problem for the financial sector stability. 
so while i agree that we need to have more access to information and more transparent way uh, but at the same time uh, when we are dealing with banks again i am repeating only banks because they take uh, depositors not with mutual funds not with rating agencies not with uh, stock market entities uh, uh, investors and so on and so forth but the banks deal with <coughs> people's money your money my money and anything uh, any run on a large bank can lead to a financial sector disability so for from that angle i think we have extreme responsibility as journalist and author and of course the uh, agencies also act responsibly sometimes they may take little longer than we wish mm -hmm. that's it yeah thanks so much uh, puja uh, could we get to some questions and i know giri i want to come back to you on something at me perhaps hopefully we'll have a question on that uh let me just so i think benedict here has a question uh, shankar yeah. sure benedict uh, the regulator's role you know um how to improve the regulator's role and uh, yeah you know whether yeah, I, I, I i'm reading that actually so yeah. perhaps um, giri can uh, respond to that uh, in, in your case i just got a buzzer uh, that that was a buzzer so it's 5 minutes left which is why uh, there's a buzzer from the app yeah yeah so so giri uh, in your case the regulators were uh, not just banks but also the listing agencies the parent uh, fishery watch dogs and um, the courts what what can we do to improve their uh, you know things on that front to make it easier for all these stories to come out of the truth to come out so you know uh, actually the regulators as well as the bank officials were in awe of major malia you know that that was you know i remember so these bank officials uh, calling me up and telling me that you know we took hands with vijay malya <laughs> i mean yeah. so hilarious uh, and uh, he would not turn up uh, he, he would uh, they would they would ask him for example to come up and explain why the loan is getting delayed what he, what is going to do and he would always never turn up he would send some someone else there but whenever he turned up it was a huge celebration out there in the in the board room okay they would, everybody would shake hands with him and he would say very nice things to uh, to them and as far as the regulator is concerned i think they actually failed you know i remember just 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 before the you know during the silent period ahead of the uh, quarterly results he would hold a um, you know if there was an if there was some kind of a meeting or some kind of a uh, con press conference where he was around he would freely talk about a whole lot of things and that would that would actually influence the stock uh, his stock and it would go up I don't know how the regulators allowed all this. I, I, I and and these bank officials woke up very very late. Uh, they they just won't uh, pin him down. For me, they 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 never realized that uh, the. I mean, individually they didn't realize that uh, the scam was so high. And and the other thing is that I I still remember so, soon after he fled the country, he came out with a press statement saying that I keep visiting a whole lot of countries. My, I just wanted to spend some time with my family in London, and whenever anyone needs, I'll come back. Exactly 15 days later, at that time, very few people knew that uh, he had actually taken off, uh, you know, 40 million dollars of which Diageo had paid him for, uh, uh, you know, um, stepping down from uh, a whole lot of companies of the United States. And then, um, and he went there. and then he issued out a press statement uh, saying uh, uh, making a lot of allegations against the banks but the truth was that he if if the banks filed a filed a case uh, in the uh, in the tribunal he would file multiple cases k cases and it would keep on dragging and dragging and dragging so uh, i i i do hope that uh, i'm sure now the regulators know exactly what's happening around and uh, hopefully the banks the lenders also know but sometimes i feel uh, even now when i read uh, reports they are not as uh, strict as they ought to be yeah thanks sir we have time for one more quick question for pawan sure um actually we are okay okay, okay. I, uh, i just wanted to uh, sure sure this great point tamal made about you know that it's all about making love or finding the right switch i know uh, pawan uh, also had that access with nirav modi when he was uh, uh better indoor right than what we see him in 
uh, in pictures. Yeah. Oh, no, just to be clear. You are a fitness freak, if I may call you that. You're a, I try. A tough, I try. Right? So yeah. uh, tell me, uh, the question from one of our audience members is, how do you verify, uh, get two sources to verify, uh, you know, uh, uh, some information before you go ahead and publish it? Did that access, the personal access you had with Nirav Modi and finding the right switch help you, you know, solve no, it? No, for sure. So let me just clarify. I never spoke to Nirav Modi after I started writing the book. I certainly reached out to his lawyers and uh, tried to get access to him at that point in time. His lawyers who were the same lawyers, Claire Montgomery for Vijay Malia as well. They declined and they said he's not going to talk to you. I said, you know, this is your chance to talk to you, talk about your side of the story. But he didn't want to. He was already in prison at that time. But I gave him that opportunity. But I think I think the deeper insights about his personality and his behavioral uh, uh, psychology and all of that really came from the five or ten times I had met him during interviews in the past. And so I don't know if you've uh, read the book or not, but the book opens with actually uh, a chapter where I am going in his car to meet him at yes. a Alagora store mm -hmm. where he has been awake for three days nonstop because he has had an income tax rate and the authorities have taken a vast amount of money from him. I don't know how much it was in real life. It was in the tens of crores. And, and you describe uh, his big ring. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. and so and it was a, a very large diamond ring. I mean, the whole room was bathed in that red light. You know, it was it was really eerie. But the the fact of the matter is that he, you know, that is probably the tenth or twelfth time I was meeting him, and I, I had never seen him look like that. He had not shaved in three four days. He looked stressed. You could see his eyes were bloodshot, and he was clearly uh, a man on the edge. But the confidence that came out on the other side was also very interesting, and you know. He actually said to me at one stage that, you know, I'm very impressed. I said, with what? And he said, the professionalism of our authorities, our tax authorities, they're so professional. They're really such, such good employees we have in the, in the government. They count money so well. And so, you know, these kinds of statements that he made uh, always would tie up with, of course, the fact that I would talk to his former employees later on. And to some extent, um, I had that connection with him because, yes, he used to be fairly obese at one stage and then he started losing a lot of weight and got very focused on watching his calories and maintaining his body fat levels and all of that. But at the and other point, I had first... He asked you how you... He yeah. asked you how, how do you manage, right? Yeah, he did. And, you know, I used to tell him things like, you know, I climb stairs when you can't work out in Mumbai. And he would tell me things like he stops eating at 7 p.m. in the evening. So, like... Uh, other authors have a connection over a, a pet or a cat. This was a, a common uh, interest factor that we had as we discussed that. And, you know, so I he actually spoke to me before he left the country and I tried to reach him and he wouldn't give me anything on the record. But uh, the level of, uh, I guess, comfort that he had was to the point where he even said to me half jokingly. And it was, you know, it is really funny when you are talking to somebody and they are playing on the headlines on the TV channels in front of you, full stop, wanted, fugitive, and the guy is talking to you. It's a very strange sensation. And he actually said at that point in time that um, I spent so many years budgeting for media coverage and advertising and endorsements. And in the last three days, I've got all of this for free. It's quite that was just wonderful. Um, I think before all of you go, um, because we missed introducing Shankar, let's also give it up to Shankar for being able to bring out all these stories from all of you. Um, you know, everything from the reporting to the verification to how you manage with the actual conversation to be able to, you know, befriend them enough in an organic way to, you know, um, bring out the real stories, right? So uh, Shankar here, uh, he's a writer and editor with The Wharton at uh, Pennsylvania, at the University of Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. And he was also the former resident editor of the Economic Times, Mumbai and Bangalore. So Shankar, thank you very much. Oh, thank you.